statement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Firstly, Mr. Speaker, I would like to congratulate uh, my local MP on his election to the role of Speaker. Uh, could I start, Mr. Speaker, by saying a fond greeting to Jeremy Greenbrook Held of Oriental Bay. In the letters to the editor in the Dominion Post on November the 24th, under the heading, Just Who Is This Man Joyce? Mr. Greenbrook Held lamented that I had made it into my role without giving a single interview. This will come as a surprise to a number of journalists who had interviewed me prior to that time, but I will nevertheless attempt to fill some gaps for Mr. Greenbrook Held today. I live north of Auckland, but I am a Naki boy, born and raised in New Plymouth. It's a wonderful part of the world, and I love to go back and visit the mountain, the parks, and the wild west coast. However, I have to say I'm a fan of pretty much all of this country. I'm actually a bit of a greenie, uh, just not the type that sits over that side of the house. As it is for all of us, my family came here from lands far away. My father's family are Irish Catholics. My great-grandfather Eugene Joyce arrived as a young man on the Invercargill in 1879. He married Alan and they settled in Taranaki where they had seven children, one of them my grandfather Len, a beekeeper who lived in Eltham with his wife Eileen, which is where my father grew up. On my mother's side, my great-grandmother, Granny Hooper, was a Cockney. She migrated with her family in 1878, landing in Nelson after four months at sea. She must have liked it here because she lived to 101. And I can vaguely remember her 100th birthday party when I was about five. My mother was born in Kaaponga. Her father was a lawyer, a turned insurance salesman, and a lay preacher in the Anglican Church. Their family were staunch Anglicans, my father's family were staunch Catholics from a time when those differences did matter. It tested both families when my parents married in 1961, now nearly 50 years ago. I'm thrilled they're both here together in the gallery today. My parents scrimped and borrowed and bought a four-square dairy in New Plymouth. They weren't greatly educated. They both left school at 15, but they worked really hard to make a go of their business and their family. They ran a seven-day business and brought up five kids at the same time. From where I'm sitting today, that seems pretty heroic. My family then is from a long line of small business people. Apart from a few years managing a supermarket, my father and mother always owned their own businesses, including their own supermarket. So it's probably not a surprise that I did the same. I had my first taste of radio when I was finishing my zoology degree at Massey University in 1983. A bunch of us worked on Radio Massey. In 84, you may recall, there was an election. So we decided to run a series of current affairs shows uh, in, the, in the style of the political uh, TV shows of the time with intercut interviews. With seriously inferior equipment, a fearless group of us worked 24 hours at a time to bring to air the hugely important Radio Massey election specials on political issues of the day. We interviewed luminaries like the late Bruce Beetham and the late Trevor DeClean and put these shows to air for audiences of roughly 50 people <laughs> each night probably 48 of whom would have preferred to hear the latest Joy Division track. So I could have been a journalist, maybe. I have a brother and a sister who are both members of that truly esteemed profession. Instead, it was during those late night sessions at Radio Massey that five of us decided to start a commercial radio station of our own. We each put in $100, and Energy Enterprises, which became the Radio Works, was born with $500 in the bank. It ran as a summer station in New Plymouth for three years, which was all we were allowed to do under the law of that time, each time making a bit of money to help pay for our full-time FM licence application. We chased down shareholders and a board of directors, went to a licence hearing with the Broadcasting Tribunal, and then waited what was 15 long months for a decision to be released. During that time, we lost three of our number, I think they got bored, and found one more. In mid-1987, Energy FM got a licence to start broadcasting across Taranaki, and on November 30th that year, we went to air. Running your own business is hard work. It's hard work a lot of the time and fantastic fun some of the time. Running your own radio station is even more fun. The three of us poured all we had into that business. We continued to live like university students for years, on the grounds that if we hadn't got used to a more comfortable lifestyle, we wouldn't miss it. We bought stations in Tauranga and Hamilton. We started The Edge and Solid Gold FM and built those two and The Rock into national satellite-delivered networks. 
We added stations uh, by growth and acquisition until by 2000 we had offices in every major town and city in the country and 650 staff across four networks and 18 local radio stations. It was an amazing ride. We all learned a huge amount about growing and running companies, organisational cultures and getting the best out of people. I met and worked with hundreds of fantastic people, many of whom I count as friends today. Throughout, we made mostly the same board, Norton Moller, Derek Lowe and John Armstrong. They were my mentors commercially and I'm greatly indebted to them. Ken West rated our share register on the stock exchange in 2000. Some of us held out for a while, but eventually we realised the dream was over, and I retired from my role as CEO of the Radio Works on my 38th birthday. It was time to take stock and time to give something back. I joined the gym. I started running. Unfortunately, I later stopped running. <laughs> and I joined the National Party. I, I put my name forward and nearly stood in 2002, but as it turned out, it would have been a purely academic exercise. <laughs> Instead, I got my first National Party job after the election. I was asked to chair the campaign review and then the full strategic review of the organisation. It was an absolute honour to do both and to be trusted by a set of people who had no history by which to trust me. The party in 2002 was hurting pretty bad and I was conscious of the need to take real care. The rebuilding of the National Party was a team effort, and I'm very proud to have played my part. However, a lot of the credit must go to our party's president. Judy Kirk is now coming up towards seven years in the role. In 2002, when she took over as president, an opinion poll that week rated the National Party at 18 per cent. For the first time in its history, it was in danger of no longer leading the centre-right in the New Zealand Parliament. In the 2008 election one month ago, the National Party achieved 45% of the party vote, the highest vote by any political party under MMP and the highest vote full stop since 1990. It's a fantastic turnaround, ably led from the front by our new Prime Minister, the Honourable John Key, and prior to him, our previous leaders, Don Brash and Bill English. However, any great leader needs an organisation to lead and Judy Kirk rebuilt that organisation without sacrificing either her decency or her principles. When all is said and done, I'm confident her name will be up there as one of the National Party's great presidents, alongside the name of her mentor, Sir George Chapman, and that will be no more than she deserves. It's often traditional to thank your electorate workers at your maiden speech for helping you get to Parliament. I am, of course, one of the lesser beasts, a list MP, and worse still, one that didn't stand in an electorate. But I did run a campaign of sorts, a little bit dire in places, according to some of my critics, <laughs> but redeemed by a fine candidate who shone through despite the poor support he received from his national campaign chair. <laughs> there are many people I can and do want to thank for that campaign, particularly those at Campaign HQ in Wellington and the thousands of volunteers around the country who put up with the rather dictatorial requirements of the Wellington crew. I won't mention names today, they all know who they are. Can I just say that I couldn't hope to work with a finer bunch of people? So via a stint running another marvellous, proud, smallish New Zealand company with another great team of people, Jason's Travel Media, I arrive here in this building, this hermetically sealed vortex, which is our parliament. So what contribution can I make to this place? Who do I represent? Well, I think I can be a voice for the people who always pay their taxes and who want to see them go to a good home. Primarily because I have been in business for most of the last 21 years, I can bring an understanding of the thinking of business people, small and medium-sized business people in particular, that organise most of the wealth creation that takes place in this country. I understand the mentality of those who get frustrated by government, getting in the way of them doing their job who chafe at needless regulation and the sight of wasted tax money, that get frustrated by poorly performing infrastructure. I understand the fear they have of government organisations muscling in on their industries by spending public money to compete with them in their marketplace for no good reason. I bring a real understanding of the value of a dollar. From the time I was a little tacker sitting at my family dining table as my parents added up the week's takings, I understood that there was no money around if you didn't go out and earn it yourself. 
I understand those people who see Wellington as a great sucking sound, which hoovers up more and more of the nation's money so that politicians can look like heroes when they spend it. People who are happy to pay their share, but aren't happy to see it wasted. I also understand what drives people, the desire to better the lot of this themselves and their families under their own steam, and not to have to rely on government handouts. And I understand that as a country we have limitless cause on our resources and limited resources. I know the only way we are going to progress in the manner we all hope for and provide for those less fortunate is by spending the money we have wisely and spending most of our time working out how to grow faster to pay for all the things we need. And I think I understand what's possible in organisations that think small and nimble where the front line is encouraged and well resourced and the back office is pared back, turn to what the customer is seeking. One of the distinctive features of this country is that we are a small group of islands at the bottom of the world. There's only four and a quarter million of us. Small can be tough. It means small home markets, not as many resources, not as big a pool of talent as some bigger countries. However, our smallness need not be a negative. It can be a strength and it should be more often. Individuals with ambition and drive have shown through our history they can achieve a lot more here, a lot more quickly than they can in bigger countries. One great running coach, one great rowing coach can achieve amazing things. Our smallness means a high proportion of us are interconnected. People used to talk a lot about the six degrees of separation. In New Zealand, I'm sure it's just two or three half the time. Our smallness can translate to nimbleness, the ability to change course, move quickly, make things happen. Sadly, from a vantage point outside government and now already inside it, I can see that we get wrapped up in the fact that this new regulation or law or entitlement or initiative is world best practice, that by doing it we are suddenly right up there with the EU or the UK or the US. Maybe a world beating, all singing, all dancing, multi-layered process is the correct approach for a large country. Maybe for us, we can trim it down, shorten it, and dare I say, spend less money doing it. Put it this way, if we can't, how can we compete with much larger countries? I'm for fair and sensible rules of commerce and social interaction. We just need to scale them for our size and look for the simpler way. I believe we have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity in this country and a corresponding risk that goes with it. We can recapture our mojo and become the feisty, resourceful, exciting, number eight wire sort of place that enabled all our forebears to make a success of themselves way down here at the bottom of the world. Or we can fade away and continue on the path of figuratively and maybe one day even literally being the smallest and poorest also ran state of Australia. I don't believe I bring any pretensions to this new role. I'm honoured to be provided the opportunity to serve and I will work diligently to repay the confidence that has been shown in me by my party, by my leader and by New Zealanders. When it comes to work, I'm a believer in doing the hard yards. In rugby terms, and I stress my familiarity with the code has pretty much always been as a fan, I like to grind it out, nothing too flashy. I also these days like to have a little balance. You may ask what I'm doing here. Apparently it's a little bit tricky in this parliament to have balance, but I find it helps people keep perspective, which also might be a bit tricky here. I have an inspiration though, my wonderful wife Suzanne, our daughter Amelia and Gemma the Retro Doodle. I know they will insist on seeing me regularly and no more than I will insist on seeing them. Mr Speaker, I will work diligently to help make this country a stronger, more successful and proud place. That's why I'm here, for no other reason. If I can help do that, then I will be able to hold my head high when I report back to New Zealanders when my time here is done.